So, dear Dharma friends, so today Rimche will offer some instructions in relation to the bardo, to the intermediate state. So generally we speak of six different kinds of bardos. Bardo means intermediate state. So among these six, what will be the first? The first is called this natural bardo of this life, or this birth and life, as it's called. So by the time our consciousness enters from a previous life into the womb of the mother, and then through the process of birth, all the way up till we die, so in other words, this present life, that's the first part of this we call this natural part of this life. <laughs> So what is the significance of this bardo? So we have this first bardo, this part of this natural life. Uh, what is there to be done? So obviously we uh, obtain the human rebirth or precious human rebirth. And then uh, we have to study. I mean, we are trained and we study in this life and then we work and we get into activity and we do our livelihood. That's what we do generally. But then if we look more from a deeper level, how we can be more beneficial since everybody strives for happiness. We want really happiness as a natural movement towards happiness. So for this, we really need the Dharma. We need the precious Dharma in order to, to reach some lasting happiness. So now, based on this uh, precious human river, which we have now, so it's now, that's this precious support, which we have to apply right now. So it's for the moment right now, for the future, as well as for the bardo in between, it lies all at this precious moment, at this precious opportunity which we have right now. Uh, the support of this precious human river. So we have to prepare right now in this life. So 
David Rimche was just explaining right now, if we take it from the context of the 37 practices of the Bodhisattvas, that's exactly which is summarized in the first verse, I believe. It's the first one, yes. Uh, so it says here in the first verse, uh, it says, at this time, when a difficult to gain ship of leisure and fortune has been obtained, ceaselessly hearing, pondering and meditating day and night in order to liberate others and oneself from the ocean of psychic existence is the Bodhisattva's practice. <coughs> So, all the essence is mm, surprised here in these 37 practices of the Bodhisattvas, as we just heard. And uh, this applies very much to this life, to the bardo of this life. Uh, and it says there is no time to be lazy. It's like in some of the Bardo root verses, which you memorize them or he quotes from there, it says, there is no time to be lazy in this life. Contemplate again and again uh, upon impermanence, uh, death and impermanence. So, <clears throat> this precious human rebirth among the six realms of existence and uh, psychic existence, the human rebirth is truly a very precious opportunity. And particular among the human rebirth, what we call the precious human rebirth, it's a ripper for a human body which is endowed with the 18 uh, freedoms and endowments. So that's extremely difficult to reach such a precious human rebirth. Uh, we can see that from different kind of perspectives it's difficult to get. For example, uh, in terms of number, if we compare it with the animal realm, all the animals who live above the earth or below or in the water, we see there's like countless amount of animals. Uh, which, uh, which is much, much more in the amount of numbers than humans. And all these elements, uh, this, sorry, all these animals have this natural movement towards happiness. Mm -hmm. They want to be happy too in their own right and avoid suffering and uh, experiences of suffering. So if we contemplate just from this, for example, from the point of number, we see that it's extremely rare to get a precious human rebirth. And if we take that really to heart, we see that something very precious and can truly rejoice in it. But then it's not enough to just have this precious human rebirth and to rejoice in it. But we really need to make use of it, of this precious support. And for this it's important to contemplate upon uh, death and impermanence. To really take this to heart, that this body will not stay. Uh, there's no time to be lazy as was just uh, suggested by this first uh, line, uh, the first uh, verse, actually, of the 37 Bodhisattva practices, like practice applied day and night. So there's no, don't waste this uh, precious, this precious opportunity, this precious space. And uh, if we take this to heart, that not only do we have a precious human rebirth, 
we contemplate upon death and impermanence. So then the next thing which comes into the play is the law of cause and effect. And we really start to become careful of uh, what kind of actions we conduct, what kind of actions we do, and what is to be abandoned. And for that, in order to, uh, to follow the law of cause and effect, and uh, we ultimately don't waste this precious opportunity, we have to, in these three important dimensions, we have to listen to Dharma, we have to contemplate upon what we listen, and then ultimately also practice and apply it in meditation. First, like in our worldly context, we go to school, like sometimes 15 years, we educate ourselves. So also in the Dharma, it's, it's good to educate ourselves, to, to study deeply, since it's so vast, the Buddha's teaching actually would have no end, uh, all the studies. But then also it's important not to leave it there, but to bring it in the next level, into contemplation, and ultimately to practice it. And the actual application of practice, again, of the Dharma is nothing else than the practice of the 37 uh, practices of the Bodhisattva. All is there in the practical application. So it's important, these three dimensions of listening to the Dharma, then to contemplate what we heard and then to apply it in practice. And again, uh, if we just hear how, how difficult it is to obtain a precious human rebirth endowed with the 18 freedoms and endowments, we can contemplate it, or first we hear it from different levels. It's difficult from an uh, example point, different from the point of view of cause, the causes to reach a precious human rebirth, and then also in terms of numbers. Uh, so it's important that we analyze it in our own mind, to really investigate not just take it on, but really investigate it. 
And that's then the second level. For example, again, if we look at the numbers just in the ocean, sometimes if we go to the ocean and uh, we just take a handful of water, we see sometimes many beings in there, very small beings, sometimes they're extremely small, we can hardly not see them. Then we also know that there is very big beings in the ocean, sentient beings, animals. Uh, so there's countless beings, small and big one. And uh, if we take this to heart and really contemplate, we come to, well, oh, it's really very difficult. I mean, all these animals go, uh, they go for difficult states. And it's really uh, seldom and very precious to have a precious human rebirth. So they will be like, not just hear it, uh, so to say, the instruction, but to really contemplate it uh, in the meaning. And then, uh, as the next level, not just leave it with contemplation, to really apply it uh, in meditation. Uh, obviously, we do have to work in our daily life, we have to maintain our life, but then we bring to our mind, well, actually, if this life comes to an end, when I die, all these activities I do in this life, work and all this busyness, this commotion, is actually then not that important when I die, and not that meaningful. What I will carry with me uh, into the bar the next life are the imprints which, uh, which reflected with my mind stream and solely based on the law of cause and effect and I have no real independence and control what's going to happen with me and where I'm going. So if this then, uh, then we are really urged uh, to, to practice and to really look what is really the, uh, the causes for happiness. Well the causes for happiness for now and for the future is loving kindness uh, and compassion and to really regard it and appreciate this as a cause, love and loving kindness and compassion as a cause which will go through many many lifetimes, will benefit me from now on uh, onwards and it will temporarily lead to rebirths in uh, higher realms and ultimately will be the cause to reach a full and perfect enlightenment. So to truly meditate now upon the loving kindness and compassion, uh, to integrate it and to make it our practice. Uh, for example, in the morning when, I'm, when I wake up, I mean, in the room she asks, when we wake up, uh, you might have thought, oh, I'm just so tired, I just want to turn around and sleep a little bit longer. If you can bring then this, this thought in your mind, how precious this human rebirth is. How, uh, how cherishing this precious human rebirth is, and also contemplate about death and impermanence, and uh, how difficult it was to gain such a precious support, then we are motivated to, to actually practice. And we recognize that which in the long run will help me will just be the precious dharma. Then we get up immediately and bring forth a wholesome motivation of loving kindness and compassion. So therefore it says, in one of these lines of the root verses of the bardo, it says, uh, bring in an undistracted way, listening, contemplating and meditating onto the path. So that's important, to constantly contemplate and think about the law of cause and effect, and to look in the mind. What state of mind uh, is it in right now? Is there any anger in my mind? Is there jealousy, miserliness, or other disturbing emotions? And if it's so, to apply immediately an antidote. Since these uh, disturbing emotions and these states of mind will only be causes for, uh, for rebirths in lower realms, like hatred uh, connects to the hell realm, miserliness to the hungry ghost realm, and uh, dull stupidity to the animal realm, and so forth. So, to be able to give up these causes, these unwholesome causes, mm -hmm. and to transform it into something wholesome through the 37 practices of the Bodhisattva. Also in the 37 practices, it's in one verse it says, uh, the path or the practice of the Bodhisattvas is uh, to practice uh, listening, contemplating and meditating. Mm -hmm. So in essence is to bring love, loving kindness and compassion onto the path. ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
And there is no time to waste, uh, to waste his life, and no time to be lazy, so to say. So that's the verse four, actually, in the thirty-seven practices. And Rumi said, uh, "I should not read it. You can read it yourself. I guess by now everybody has this booklet, and so we can save some time. Otherwise, Rumi said, I cannot finish the bar instructions." Sandi so to contemplate upon impermanence, death and impermanence in a dimension, first we have listening, uh, <coughs> contemplating and then meditating. And on the level of meditation, we have two levels, the relative level and the absolute level. On the relative level, it's the, the contemplation and the generation in our mind stream of loving kindness and compassion. On the absolute level, it is the insight uh, that from absolute point of view between Buddhas and sentient beings, there is not a real difference. From the point of view of the base or the nature of the mind, uh, there is no true uh, difference. And so it says also in one of the root words of the bardo, uh, <clears throat> developing appearances and mind as the path, I shall actualize the three kayas. So to bring this into the path, appearances and mind, uh, may I actualize through this the three kayas. Uh, so that's the recognition that between sentient beings and Buddhas, from the fundamental ground of the mind, there is no uh, true significant difference. So I to clarify an example here. So it's important to recognize that all appearances are might. To take to heart and recognize that all appearances are mine from an ultimate point of view. If we take, for example, the example of this crystal or any crystal, like the crystal in this prayer wheel, uh, if the light, the sunlight, or any light shines in a crystal, we have the spectrum of the lights, like the rainbow or the different spectrum of the lights. Uh, if we know the absolute truth, we know that all these lights are nothing else than the dynamic expression of the crystal itself, with the coming together of this condition of the light. But not knowing this, that it's just a dynamic expression of the crystal in itself, and this is also an example which is given in the Great Perfection, then we hold the, the, the light, the spectrum of the light, and the reflection is something different. We see it as something different than the source, and we see it as dual, like there's a, a manifestation here, and there's something over there, 
And for this, we fall into duality. That's, of course, just an example, but that's what's happening to our mind. If we don't recognize that all appearances are mind, we fall into this dynamic of uh, attachment and aversion uh, to grasping to substantiality and characteristic of things, which is nothing else than the cause of samsara. This fundamental duality of me, I, and others gives them rise to... Uh, to the grasping, or in fact is nothing else than the manifestation of the grasping to a self, which manifests as the duality of I or self and others. Based upon that, uh, the six disturbing emotions arise. And based on that, then we have the whole play of the duality of samsara and nirvana. If we don't understand that all appearances are nothing else than mind, based on this grasping and the duality which derives from it, uh, all the six realms appear in the in six realms of existence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> で、ハコの手で、手で、ギーのでに、大事に入れてね、ゆるもまけてる。コラクトとか、手で、ハコを入れる。さあ、ちょっと線の手に、たぶん、さっき言ったんですけど、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょ
So that's this uh, non-dual primordial wisdom by recognizing our true nature of the mind. And, uh, but if we don't recognize this and coming together with certain conditions, we fall into, based on grasping to a self, into this uh, duality of self and others. And based on this duality of self and others, we give rise to disturbing emotions, and this is, as we heard many times, the cause for a rebirth in the six different realms of samsara. On the other hand, if we recognize our true nature, if our being is, uh, <clears throat> is endowed with bodhicitta, uh, we recognize that the root of samsara and the root of suffering itself uh, is nothing else than, uh, than uh, our own self-existing intrinsic awareness. Uh, that it's like this non-dual state uh, of the mind, uh, which is uh, completely beyond uh, any extremes. Uh, it's beyond extremes of uh, grasping at substantiality or uh, uh, definite characteristics. And this is what is meant here by this line again in its root verse, developing appearances and mind as the path, I shall actualize the free kayas. So the free kayas here, it's meant uh, to actualize the free kayas if we uh, understand the true mode of abiding of the nature of our mind. If we recognize it as a non-dual primordial wisdom, that's nothing else than the manifest uh, free kayas. And this uh, nature or true mode of abiding of our mind, in essence, it is empty. So the essence of the nature of the mind is empty, just very much like the sky-like nature. And this uh, represents the Dharmakaya, or is the Dharma the level of the Dharmakaya, the truth body. Uh, but then it's not a blank emptiness. This is not the end, or it's not a blank or complete emptiness. Uh, to show that it's not falling in the extreme of nihilism, uh, there is an unceasing uh, clarity aspect arising. So that's, that's why it says the nature of, the, uh, of our uh, mind, of the essence of the mind, is clarity. It is uh, this consciousness right now which is clear and aware. Uh, or it is clarity and emptiness, or the non-separability of clarity and emptiness. It is clear and yet it's empty. It's empty and yet it's clear. Henceforth, this inseparability of uh, emptiness and clarity. And this is the level of the Sambhogakaya. And uh, in this unification of clarity and emptiness, uh, there's all the qualities of the Buddhas uh, are there. They are manifest. Uh, they are there, the Buddha qualities. It is this, uh, this unchanging, uh, great bliss, Deva Chempo. We are not just happiness. I think it's really bliss here. Unchanging, great bliss, beyond birth, beyond death. Uh, this is the actual state of uh, Vajradhara. Uh, on the other hand, if we don't recognize this, the nature of the mind, we fall into the duality of self and others. And uh, with the circle, uh, as we heard before, if we recognize the essence of our mind, then this, out of this unification of clarity and emptiness comes this unhindered movement of a great compassion towards all sentient beings. And uh, that's the Nirmanakaya. So the, some, the Dharmakaya and the Nirmanakaya, they're like unchanging, uh, pure states. But in the Nirmanakaya, we have both. We have pure and impure manifestations. Uh, <clears throat> Pure manifestations will be pure beings, even though they might have an ordinary body, but they are beings, uh, human beings, who their mind is completely abiding in non-duality. So in other words, they constantly abide in the uh, nature of the mind. Whereas unpure uh, beings, they will be ordinary <coughs> sentient beings, ordinary uh, yeah, sentient beings and humans. Uh, we call them also Nyamanakaya, but in an impure form, in the sense that they don't recognize their true nature. Even though they have uh, uh, the Buddha nature as the Tathagata Garbha as their fundamental base of their being, uh, by not recognizing this, their mind becomes hard and coagulated like ice. Uh, so therefore, it's, uh, it's important to recognize our true base, uh, this uh, true base of our mind, which is actually pure. It's, it's originally pure. It's always pure. Uh, that which makes appearances and beings uh, impure is only temporary states, these adventitious states. Uh, and they, <coughs> they arise actually based on the duality, grasping to uh, solidity and to characteristics of self and phenomena, and it's the whole root of samsara. 
but it doesn't really exist as an inherent, separate existence, this uh, impurity that henceforth it's at is only temporary stains uh, from the crown, from the true crown of being, it's a primordial purity. And therefore it says here again, uh, I shall actualize the free kayas by recognizing this inseparability of the nature of the mind of clarity and emptiness. And then he continues in the, in the root verses, yeah, by the way, the root verses of the Bard of Karmalingpa. It says, Now, when for once I have obtained a human body, uh, there is no time to rest on the path of distraction. So, since we have now this precious opportunity, this precious space, this working base of the precious human rebirth, uh, we should not waste it in meaningless activity. You know, we do have to do our daily activities, but still we should bring it uh, together with the essence of the Dharma. As it says, the essence of uh, the Buddha Dharma is to work with one's mind, to purify your mind if you want. Or as uh, in his famous quote, which we heard also yesterday, um, the essence of the Dharma is to tame this mind of ours, to tame our own mind. And uh, how do we tame our mind exactly for the practice of uh, a generation of uh, loving kindness and compassion? And to be uh, eager to give up disturbing emotions like hatred, jealousy, and so forth, which are the cause for a rebirth in the low realms. So, henceforth, not to waste our time. So, there's no time to rest uh, on the path on the, of distraction. <coughs> So, therefore, as we heard in the first part of, if we gained this precious human rebirth and contemplate about the difficulty of uh, obtaining a precious human rebirth endowed with the freedom and endowments, uh, and if we really bring this in our minds, then we can integrate. If we really take it to heart, not as a concept, if we really take it to heart, then for example, it doesn't matter at night whether we can sleep or not sleep. If we don't sleep, well then we just practice. We really integrate this practice then, this contemplation, and uh, bring it on the path, this uh, precious jewel uh, of, the, of this precious human rebirth, uh, together with the practice of loving kindness and compassion and uh, bodhicitta, to really work with it and not to waste it. Uh, <laughs> Malandi, <laughs> Let 
Dedi o çok adam dedi, ne eder, yumu bir gizli lanı, devirdin hiç oğlu oraya çık beni, dedi. Bana pardon çaktım dedi. Tabi o ne yapalım, iyi bak dedi. Bana dedi, ne yapalım, bir şey de oraya mı yok da. Bir şey de ola, kazı da kare, iyi bir kane. Bana dedi, ne kadar bak çaktı dedi. Karayın içine, yani, ただただただ、ちゃんちゃんくらいまで、ちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃんとちゃ
So, as we said, uh, to abandon this careless sleeping corpse of ignorance, that's important in this practice. If we take the, the second part of the part of the dream state, uh, daily dream state to heart, and if we really would practice it, Otherwise, uh, what can happen, we just fall asleep and we're so tired and think, oh God, I'm so tired and uh, it's so beautiful to sleep, to be in this deep slumber and uh, until I wake up in the morning. But actually, from a practice point of view, it's really, as it says here, uh, Ronyal, it's really a sleeping corpse. We're like a sleeping corpse and completely unconscious and we can't use it for the benefit of practice. So it's, uh, it's important to make use of this state, of this state called the second part of the part of dream. And uh, there's uh, specific instructions, and we just summarize them. But what is happening actually here in uh, in sleep, and particularly when we fall uh, asleep and then dream, are similar states, uh, same like uh, when we die actually. So we have something what is called the white path or the white vision which appears, and then we have something which is called the red uh, vision, and then the black vision, and then we fall completely unconscious, meaning completely uh, and we are gone, we are in, uh, in sleep. So these are the subtle dissolution processes which we know from the death process, but this also happens every night when we fall asleep. So it's the same process and we have a great chance actually to recognize that. This uh, white path or white vision, the red and the black, and then we fall un completely unconscious and we actually arrive at the ground, at the fundamental ground of our mind which is nothing else than the Buddha nature or the Tathagata Garbha. Or this is the true mode of abiding of our mind. Whether we recognize it or whether we not recognize it, it is there. It's our Buddha nature where it says that uh, the nature of our mind is primordially Buddha. These are uh, profound instructions from uh, Mahamudra and Dzogchen. If we can uh, recognize this, this level of practice, if we can recognize it, then uh, we can use uh, uh, the clear light, luminosity at this path. And it says it's also the meeting of the child and the sun luminosity at this moment. And uh, without having to go further than when we die, we can liberate ourselves at this stage of the, of the bardo. 
So uh, this the, henceforth it is so important to be able to uh, habituate ourselves to the to this part of the sleep and to be slowly able to integrate it uh, into uh, into our practice. So if we uh, recognize this, then we can really use this also in the practice in the night. This uh, clear light, this meeting of uh, uh, clear light luminosity of uh, mother and son, and uh, we can wake up in that in that recognition. And uh, so that's a very profound state where it says, uh, we, where we can habituate ourselves and when we actually die, we can liberate ourselves truly in this ground, fundamental ground of the nature of our mind in the meeting of mother and child luminosity. Uh, we, based on these oral instructions, we liberate ourselves into the Dharmakaya directly at uh, this state. <coughs> so this is called, uh, it is this state where we liberate ourselves in the Dharmakaya, in this view without grasping, in this sky-like uh, dimension of the Dharmakaya, which is the true state of our mind. If you're not able to do that, uh, then uh, we work, this will be working directly with the clear light of the sleep, and if not, then we work directly with the dreams and the Sambhogakaya appearances, which relate very much to our Idam practice. Uh, particularly to the generation stage practices where we generate ourselves as the deity and through great habituation for that practice we'll be able then when we die at least to liberate ourselves in the second part. Uh, so here it says in the text which you quoted again uh, the next two lines so again I read always the line before so abandoning this careless sleeping corpse of ignorance I shall guide my undistracted mindfulness into the natural state Taking control of my dreams, I shall purify delusion into clear light. まらんかぶ、とびじゅんさんてちょこちょこにせばさんな、まらめもおしらんじゅんさんてよこよれ。てれてにばとりとびさんてたら、あ、だんてんたらぬもまじらん、さよぶでだんてんおりじゅんてん
so there's a deep uh, significance in his last line, which is just uh, quoted again by Rimchi a few times. Uh, Taking control of my dreams, I shall let purified illusion, then you can mean also, you're not just purify, also transform uh, into clear light, luminosity or isalva. Uh, so it's, the first is really to control uh, dreams, actually, to practice with dreams and this bardo of, uh, of dream and with the dream yoga to first recognize dreams as dreams. And sometimes we can even do that if we have very uh, difficult dreams. Sometimes if we have great fear, uh, sometimes there's some people who can recognize it, or at least they can wake up right at that moment and recognizing, oh, it was uh, just a dream. And you see that all this suffering which we went through, which seemed so real actually, uh, based on the grasping to self and disturbing emotions, that slowly, slowly we're able to recognize it as a, a stream, dream as dream. And for this also the fear in the dream uh, would, would go away. And secondly, we will be able to, to liberate ourselves, uh, to transform actually the, the complete state, even like in a pure realm, that, uh, that we can liberate ourselves into a pure realm in this state. And there's uh, stories where great lamas or great siddhas were able to do that, uh, in form that they gained a complete control over the elements, actually. Like elements like fire, water, uh, through their <clears throat> unwavering uh, uh, samadhi, deep state, uh, and th through this practice, which was just pointed out for Rumjin, they gained such a high control over the elements that they can actually transform into elements. And there even seems a story of a great Sita uh, when he was. Uh, uh, actually practicing in the night and really catch this uh, clear light, this luminosity of uh, the true nature of his mind. And he uh, practiced very much a samadhi related to water, that the Lama appeared himself, the form was gone in the night when he sleeps. It's just like, a, uh, like not a big pond, but there's like a body of water where he was sleeping. And some attendants, they even saw it. And uh, they, they saw the Lama's body is not there, but there's some water there. But then when they make a contact with it, he appears again as the form. So uh, we see also there's a, in Milarepa, there's many stories with Milarepa where he did acts like this to transform. And that's this uh, deep significance where it says here, which maybe should be added in translation. So not just taking control of dreams, but to completely purify and transform the illusion into a clear light. So that's the practice when we truly practice with uh, Özel or luminosity uh, in, in a deep state of absorption. Through this more and more we recognize that uh, there is actually also this day, uh, our daily appearances are illusory, very much like our dream appearances. If we can recognize them then there is uh, no fear actually in whatever appears. And particularly the practice which connects to the dream then uh, connects to the second part, henceforth here, for this practice one would liberate oneself in the second part. Yeah. Uh, その so again, in this line here, we should train as much to take control of dreams to really gain independence and control uh, about dreams. And that's what all, and also the clear light of deep sleep. That's what all the great yogis of Mahamudra and Dzogchen are doing. Or if they're great yogis, they're able to work with this. Uh, when they fall into deep sleep, actually, that's the best. 
uh, without in avoiding dreams, they directly uh, maintain this state and recognize this state of, uh, of luminosity with this uh, luminous, clear appearance without losing consciousness, actually, when they fall asleep, without going completely blank. Uh, they, uh, they gain, actually, uh, a handle, you would say, on this luminosity, whereas uh, normal sentient beings, we just blank out. We just fall completely unconscious, obviously, when we sleep and everything gets completely dark. And uh, so for them, for the yogis of the highest capacity, they are able to, uh, to work and to recognize with this luminosity of the deep sleep. And the next level of yogi is still on a very advanced level if they might not be able to do that. But then at least when they wake up in the morning, when they really wake up, with, before they fall into a dualistic notion in the sense of, oh, this is me, this is an I, in uh, contrast to, to other things or other people, before they fall in this duality at the best, uh, when they wake up, they would recognize right away this non-dual view of primordial wisdom. That would be the best. And if they cannot do, or if we cannot do it, at least when we wake up, before we get this notion of self and duality, we should immediately arise <coughs> in the form of the Ida. So, <clears throat> henceforth, this practice, as uh, quoted in his text, is extremely important to, in this part of the sleep, to, to work with that directly, to gain control over dreams, and to be able to slowly work with uh, the luminosity of, uh, of the state of uh, sleep. Uh, so that we avoid it, it says, uh, taking control of my dreams, I shall purify delusion into uh, clear light. Do not sleep like an animal. さあ、次、そうだ、セミシャルで、セイヤカイは、さあ、次、さあ、ここまでで、さあ、次、次、まあ、ロー、で、パニーを、その、に、セバチュラント、さあ、次、次、次、次、次、次、次、次、次、次、
the ground of our nature of our mind is this Tathagata Garbha, this Buddha nature, which is pure, which is represented by this Ida. And uh, the temporary stains of uh, self, duality, and grasping to a self, they are suspended in this moment when we wake up and generate ourselves or arise uh, immediately as the, as the Ida. And through diligent practice for this, through habituating for this, it will be actually, in the end, quite easy to liberate ourselves in the second part or into a, a pure realm. So again, it's, it's important before we wake up, sorry, before we fall asleep, for example, we recite some Mani Mantras, so Mani Pememun, see ourselves in the form as a Chinrezik, and if we could fall asleep like this and do it again and again, then in the morning, the first thing when you wake up will appear as Chinrezik again, before any dualistic notion sneaks in. So this is a very profound method, and then uh, ideally also then during the day later to continuously practice this, to be in an uninterrupted flow of, uh, of recognition of ourselves as the deity, also to recite the mantra, which has a very profound uh, connection to our nadis, to our prana, which is these days even uh, recognized by science, that it can have a very powerful effect on our health, so that's important. Mm Tell so this should be at least a practice how we integrate this practice with our uh, daily life and sleep especially when we fall asleep and it's important not to be too much preoccupied with our daily activities if we think too much of all our worries sorrows and activities we have to do we all know it. It can become very difficult to sleep. If we are too preoccupied, we have a lot of worry in our minds, we might even need to take sleep medication and after a while this will not work. Uh, so this will create a lot of uh, difficulty and uh, suffering. So it's much better actually to get habituated to when we fall asleep, uh, before we fall asleep, to really give rise uh, of our body. We appear as the wisdom deity, whichever we have a connection, recite the mantra, connect to the deity and the mantra, and then uh, gain some certainty, some uh, conviction without doubt into this practice, some stability also. So if we, uh, on the other hand, only think about this life and activities of this life, worries and work and stuff like this, this will only accumulate karma actually. And without having control, it will propel us in a direction where we have no, uh, yeah, no, no independence, no control. But then on the other hand, if we habituate ourselves deeply with the practice of the idam and the mantra, our mind will become stable in it, uh, mind will become uh, pure, and we'll be able to liberate ourselves in the bardo, <coughs> for sure, with this practice, so we don't have to wander again in samsara. Otherwise, if we're just propelled by daily normal activities, even though we have this precious human rebirth, we don't know where it's leading. We will just take a future rebirth and a future rebirth, and it might be, as we heard, to be very difficult to get again this precious human rebirth, this uh, this working base. Benesinet 
So then we go to the third bardo. The third bardo is the bardo of the meditative state. So it's called the bardo of Yana or something. It says here in the root words, uh, Ah, now that the bardo of meditation is arising for me, abandoning the mass of distractions and confusion, I shall enter the state free of the extremes of distraction and grasping. So, no matter what kind of practice we conduct, uh, this bardo of uh, meditative equipoise, it starts with refuge, bodhicitta, and then it's the main part of the practice all the way till we finish and dedicate the practice. The main part might be the practice of whether we practice shinye or vipassana, calm abiding or deep insight meditation, all the way up to the deep states of, uh, of Mahamudra. For example, also the four yogas uh, from uh, uh, simplicity, one taste all the way up to, uh, to no more meditating. Uh, so these deepest states of Mahamudra, no matter what we practice, it's important to be uh, undistracted, henceforth uh, abandoning the mass of distraction and confusion. So this is what we have to give up, uh, uh, confusion, distraction. That is which brings forth a lot of suffering, actually, in, in all beings. That's the root of uh, suffering is confusion, uh, this distraction, and the confusion which goes from it. Like uh, people who suffer, adults, children who suffer greatly, can even 
uh, bring us so far that we think life is meaningless and we would commit uh, suicide. Uh, so it's all connected to be completely bewildered, uh, distracted and uh, confused, in deep confusion when this, uh, this mind becomes a complete solid block of ice and we are bound in the bondage of our own suffering. But in contrast to that, if we can be in uh, undistracted and in an unconfused way, practice love, loving kindness, uh, bring forth a great joy in our mind and happiness, uh, then it's uh, uh, as an example like a flower which is blossoming or ice which is melting. This uh, solid block of ice which derived from grasping to a self is melting. In fact, this grasping to a self, this self was never truly established. It says uh, in a quote, where there is no truly established self, we grasp to an individual personality or an individual self. So it's not really there. So if we understand the true state of the nature of our mind, we recognize this dimension of the sky-like nature of our mind. In some contexts it's called also the view of the middle way, the Madhyamika, where it says this view is uh, beyond that which can be thought of conceptually or expressed by works. Uh, so it's this uh, view which is beyond duality of uh, self and grasping uh, to a self. And uh, we make our life really meaningful. Otherwise, even as we see animals or small insects which just crawl around, their life is, their activities are rather futile. And uh, we have to be careful that we don't do as humans similar actions. In other words, we have the opportunity to bring uh, wisdom into our life, to make it really uh, meaningful in our life, to transform non-virtues into uh, virtues. So to, uh, to not be confused and to be of, uh, of, of great benefit. Otherwise, if we fall under the, in a an, in an distracted way, under confusion, we are just under this way of uh, helplessly accumulating karma. Naturally, we just accumulate karma without having any control. On the other hand, if we practice, if we take, seize this, uh, this practice of love and loving kindness, we can make uh, this life very meaningful. Uh, temporary will be the cause for reaching the higher realms and ultimately to reach a full and perfect uh, Buddhahood. So it's about making this mind pure, to work with this mind, and to, uh, to, yeah, to work this mind. If we are confused and distracted, uh, it is the, just the experience of suffering which will come from it. And we'll never be happy, we'll never have control and independence if we are confused. So not to follow the past, not to anticipate too much the future, but to work right now with this mind in an undistracted way, bring forth love, loving kindness, and to purify this mind.
Uvodici mali smo dvije črne, na pol sa cijela mali. So if we talk about uh, confusion, uh, and we bring in relation to discursive thought, it's not just a discursive thought in itself, it's the confusion which arises in, on a deeper level. Uh, for example, if we look at a human, just a human being, we see, well, it exists, there's a human there. But if we analyze it, that the form, the physical form, is actually not the human, or it's, it's not something which is really solid or inherent existence, existing, it will... Uh, it will dissipate in the end. Uh, so then we go from the body to the mind. And if we recognize really the nature of the mind, we recognize it's, it's like a sky-like nature. We can actually not find it. We, we cannot identify it ultimately. Or if we look at the world, we see this solid world, this round world, which we grasp so, so much in it. In the end, it will dissipate. There will be coming the day where this world will be destroyed or dissipated. Uh, so to gain a trust and a conviction into, uh, into impermanence, that's important here. To recognize that all compound phenomena uh, are impermanent. Uh, this will help us greatly, otherwise we will be, uh, we'll be confused, exactly based on these conditions, uh, just two examples which were given here. And confusion uh, binds our mind. Uh, this brings forth uh, a great suffering in, in our mind. But if we can take to heart the uh, impermanence and recognize that all compound phenomena are impermanent, uh, plus uh, meditate on top of it and bring forth love and loving kindness, this will truly become a friend in our practice, like a, a stable ally. On the other hand, if we grasp at uh, singularity or solidity in our mind, this will only bring forth the two, uh, the two poles of uh, aversion, attraction and aversion. Like, uh, like I like this, I want this, I feel so attracted, or this I don't want, I really have a very strong aversion all the way up to, to hatred. And for this we beget, uh, will be distracted and in the end completely confused. So far that even under the big influence of emotions, even white we see as black, it's a symbol here. Uh, so it's Based on these uh, strong disturbing emotions, let's say aversion, anger, even hatred, uh, we grasp very strongly at uh, phenomena, at uh, things actually, and with their characteristics. But on the other hand, if we can see that things are illusory-like, that they're dream-like, and also that there is not such a real difference between uh, day appearances and dream appearances, uh, this will actually open up our mind. Uh, the tight fist of our mind and grasping to substantiality, to truly established things, uh, will loosen our mind, will become more open and relaxed. Uh, Some Tapra 
but then it says in the next line, I shall enter the state free of the extremes of distraction and grasping. Runch explains it actually on three different levels. We are undistracted, free of grasping, free of grasping, and free of any extremes. Uh, so we can establish this uh, in different traditions. In the tradition of the Madhyamika, uh, this view is established through logical arguments and reasonings. And henceforth we come to the culmination of the point of the middle way philosophy or Madhyamika. But then in the lineage of practice and blessing, uh, it's the view which is pointed out in the Mahamudra or uh, Tsopche. So uh, no matter what, it's the same. It's this absolute truth of the nature of the mind. It's this statement where we say that uh, the nature of mind is in its nature since beginning uh, Buddha. So this is the true mode or the true nature of our mind. And uh, so it's the nature of the mind which is uh, undistracted by uh, the, uh, confusion and uh, discursive thoughts. A mind which is undistracted and free of grasping. So it's a state where we are undistracted and we don't follow the discursive thoughts of the past. In other words, we don't follow the past, we don't anticipate the future. And in this pre present moment, the mind which just abides here, in right now, in the present moment, free of uh, discursive thoughts, is open and free, just like the sky, like nature. And the consciousness which recognizes this nature that's what, we, what we're heading for. And to be undistracted in this recognition, in this momentary recognition, to be undistracted in it, and also to be free of grasping. Just like the sky, we cannot grasp the sky, we cannot say the sky exists or it doesn't exist, or it is this or it is that. It is, it's, uh, it's free of all these uh, characteristics, free of all these extremes. So this is the view of uh, Mahamudra and uh, Dzogchen to uh, see directly the, the nature of the mind or the true mode of abiding of the mind uh, which is uh, in undistracted way this uh, nature of the mind which has a sky-like quality it is free of extremes and we don't grasp at it free of extremes means that it's free of all uh, mistakes of all superimpositions like uh, the, the, the two big extremes are eternalism or nihilism they would say something exists really or something doesn't exist at all and then all the other extremes which derive from it so this true nature of mind which is completely free of all extremes it's a state of non-grasping and to be completely uh, undistracted so also the same uh, the same point is pointed out in the twenty second verse of the practice of the bodhisattvas where it says the mind is uh, free of extremes I would then need to look actually this line actually also you look it up yourself again uh, from the beginning mind's nature is free from the extremes of elaboration so it's free of all this elaboration it is this or that it existing or not existing so the, the the natural mode of abiding of the mind is just naturally just like the sky <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Henceforth, it is so important as in his last line, I shall enter the stage to be free of, uh, to be undistracted, free of grasping, and free of any extremes. And then he continues, I shall attain stability in the development and completion stages, having abandoned activity at this time of one point of meditation, do not fall into the power of the illusions of negative emotions. Uh, so to give up uh, the distraction of uh, this daily life's activities, uh, which is also to recognize no matter how much wealth we accumulate, be it millions, many houses, real estate or whatever, it will be of no benefit when we die, it will have no essence when we die. That which will be really <coughs> meaningful and which has essence when we die is whether we recognize or not the nature of our mind, whether we will be able to work with that directly. And uh, therefore it's, uh, we are urged in this uh, part of uh, the meditative state, uh, this, this part to practice and to, uh, to be eager to understand the nature uh, of the mind. Uh, henceforth, uh, ha having abandoned activity at this time of one-pointed meditation, so that's the practice in this bardo, do not fall into the power of delusions of negative emotions. If we practice, don't fall under the sway or under the influence of uh, disturbing emotions. See whatever appears as illusion-like, as dream-like, and uh, not to fall into, uh, into confusion by grasping at disturbing emotions and all what derives from it as something solid and substantial. So when disturbing emotions <laughs> arise, to recognize them upon arising, uh, without grasping to uh, liberate them in the nature of the mind, that's the way where uh, this solid block of ice can melt and also where disturbing emotions will uh, transform into primordial wisdom. So to, to be not confused <coughs> by disturbing emotions is important. ハイダルドルンデジリ、あ、たそこまいにちょっとよ。で、外気なしに、せいでるかんとばれ。ダブルサガンでよ、なや。ダブルドワンチャイオ。チャリンとたそこまいにちゃろ。で、で、で、せい
that's also very much a simile which everything which is constructed will uh, ultimately disintegrate. Uh, also on our own, uh, the whole world actually will disintegrate on some level. But we are not left empty-handed. We recognize here at the stage of the dissolution of the completion stage practice the nature of the mind. So that's a great jewel which we gain here. Uh, so it's it's not just this uh, emptiness, it's the nature of the mind which we recognize it. So we could say outwardly it relates to the world, inwardly on an inner level to the generation stage practice, and on a secret level it is the nature of our mind, the recognition of the nature of our mind uh, in which we gain a stable, a stable view in this uh, non-duality of the nature of minds with confidence. <laughs> Sawa的那把沙瓦子的，来过来这里看了沙瓦，生沙瓦，生沙瓦，生沙瓦，生沙瓦，生沙瓦，生沙瓦，生沙瓦，生沙瓦，生沙瓦，生沙瓦，生
uh, whereas the completion stage practice of the dissolution where we dissolve everything in the end has a very strong connection to the bard of death. So it's important to become uh, stable in the practice of both the generation and completion stage practices. <laughs> So henceforth, the last line of this uh, part, do not fall into the power or under the power of delusions and negative emotions. <coughs> To uh, to recognize disturbing emotions right when they uh, when they appear, and uh, to to not identify with them, and not to grasp at them as something solid or to attach at something substantial with uh, with definite characteristics. Uh, if we're able to do that, the mind will open up and will uh, relax, and ultimately we'll be able to liberate this disturbing emotion. If we are not able to do that, if we grasp at it as something solid, as uh, inherent, uh, existing, uh, it will bind our mind. This will uh, control and bind our mind. So even if there is a strong disturbing emotion like anger or hatred, uh, if we can recognize it right upon arising for what it is, uh, then the mind will open up and relax and ultimately will be able to liberate this disturbing emotion. On the other hand, if we are not able to recognize for what it is, let's say again, uh, aversion or hatred, it will uh, bind us, it will bind us and uh, confuse us in duality and uh, we will give rise to more hatred towards an adverse situation or a person which will ultimately be the accumulation of, uh, uh, of the karma which will be uh, the cause for being reborn in a hell realm for example. So if we look, all sentient beings of the six realms, the essence of the disturbing emotions is the same. It's about uh, recognizing them and uh, be able to recognize them at the spot. And through this, uh, without getting confused, to liberate ourselves. It's same like if there's a thousand people drowning in the ocean. If one person gets up, gets the head out of the water, in other words, uh, can liberate itself from the ocean, uh, then, then you're free. If your head is up, meaning that's a simple uh, metaphor, uh, you're free of the influence of the disturbing emotion. If you can recognize it right there at the spot, the mind will uh, liberate itself, we will be not confused and liberate ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be, fall under confusion and be uh, bound by this uh, non-recognition. <laughs> Chicken 
这些东西都是大的,人家嘛,这些东西都是大的,人家不要的。这些东西都是大的,人家不要的。这些东西都是大的,人家不要的。这些东西都是大的,人家不要的。这些东西都是大的,人家不要的。这些东西都是大的,人
So, to be not attached to, uh, to all our belongings, to all our family members, uh, to abandon attachment, grasping and clinging, this is uh, most important. And to be also generous at this moment of, of death, or actually right before, that we're able to let go of grasping to all our properties and to give them away. Otherwise, you can come to very, uh, very pitiful and sad states where there is like quarreling and fighting uh, among wealth, money, houses, estates, and stuff like this. Even children with their own parents or siblings can get into a very deep uh, disharmonious states and fight where there is in the end no love anymore, where there's actually it can come into into rage, into so deep anger that that we might even hate uh, family members, which would be. As described many times, it will be uh, with very severe consequences. It will be even uh, be the cause for a lower river. So that's why it's important to uh, to be at this moment also generous, to let go of attachment grasping, and to practice generosity, to give things away, and to think like uh, I give things away before I die. I want to enter the path which leads me towards Amitabha, towards the great happiness of Amitabha, and uh, let go of grasping attachment, belongings, and uh, instead of that, really give rise to a motivation of love and loving kindness towards all sentient beings, to practice a good heart in this moment. And it says, if we do this, uh, if we die in a state like this, uh, ideally in the highest level, we are able to liberate ourselves directly in a pure realm, like uh, Devachan, Sugavati, for example, or at least through this we'll be able to gain again a precious human river for one of the three higher rivers. Uh, so to be free of, uh, at this moment we die of grasping attachment, uh, to be also free of, uh, of aversion and yeah, aversion, attachment, and uh, be free of uh, jealousy and uh, miserliness, all this stuff which will be causes for uh, for rebirths in, in different realms, like uh, hatred in, in the hell realm, for example, miserliness in the uh, Edak, the hungry ghost, uh, jealousy, deep jealousy could 
uh, be a cause that we are born even if we are human in a place where there is so much fighting and quarreling. To really see that our mind is like a seed and to really bring the seeds to germination so it can grow as a flower in a positive way. Uh, otherwise uh, it can also mm, result in disturbing emotions as we just saw. So, so to keep that mind, uh, to purify the mind, to keep the mind pure, uh, and it says that this is like the, the, Buddha, the Buddha nature or the Buddha hood. Uh, and that's the best actually, that's the highest view if we can uh, liberate ourselves uh, in this moment. Uh, also if we can liberate ourselves in the, the clear light, that will be the, the highest, uh, highest opportunity. So when it says here, uh, I shall enter undistractedly into clear understanding of the oral instructions. So the oral instructions are the one which we were given uh, by the Lama. And uh, but basically means to remember bodhicitta, in essence, to remember bodhicitta, the altruistic enlightened mind, to remember one zidam, the lama, amitabha, the pure realm of amitabha, and then and transfer my own awareness into the sphere of unborn space. So one's own uh, intrinsic awareness or rikpa. Uh, to transform it directly into this uh, sky-like nature. So for the best would be like to liberate it in this level, uh, in the clear light of the deep sleep, which we also actually we practice in the life, but we heard before about this clear light of the deep sleep. And at the moment of this death, we would liberate ourselves in the clear light, which is nothing than the, the Dharmakaya, of the Buddhahood of the Dharmakaya. Sometimes one might ask, well, what is reaching uh, Buddhahood here? It's actually the recognition of the true state of our own being, of our Buddha nature. This will be liberated in the first bardo, in the bardo here, in the recognition of the Dharmakaya, where we recognize this, uh, uh, this true state of our intrinsic awareness and transfer our own intrinsic awareness into the sphere of unborn space. This is the, the, the resultant view of Mahamudra, this mm -hmm. guy like nature. When just, uh, when just about to be parted from this composite body of flesh and blood, realize that it is impermanent and illusory. So that's important that this compound phenomena of our body, that it's just a compound phenomena, and it's illusory, impermanent, just as in the, one of the verses of the 37 practices of Bodhisattva, it says when this uh, consciousness will leave behind this guest house, the body. So that's this meaning, to recognize that the body is a composite phenomena, it is impermanent, it is just like a guest house. And the guest, the, the mind or the consciousness uh, has to wander, has to continue in this part of death. Mm. <laughs> So then the next part is the part of the Dharmata, 
the, the true state of reality. Uh, so if we are not able to liberate ourselves so far, it is far to before, then we will have to enter the part of the Dhammata, except uh, there is uh, two uh, exceptions, individuals who are completely able to liberate themselves just before, the moment before, they will not have to enter this part of Dhammata, or also the ones who committed like uh, the, the, the unretrieval most negative deeds, they will be without the part or reborn in the lowest realms. But all the other beings will have a moderate uh, mix between uh, positive, virtuous and non-virtuous deeds will enter this part of the Dhammata. So it says, ah, now that the part of Dhammata is arising for me, having abandoned all panic and terrified perceptions, uh, I shall recognize whatever arises as the natural manifestation of my own awareness. So for an individual with the highest capacity, he would recognize that one's own mind is nothing else than the rising of the five primordial wisdoms which arise as the peaceful and wrathful deities in this part of uh, Dharmata and they will be without fear no matter whatever arises all these um, peaceful and wrathful deities uh, with loud sounds, terrifying sounds and, and uh, bright lights and uh, shimmering rays uh, they will recognize this as their own appearance and to train this it's important already in this life that we get accustomed to these uh, deities which appear for example through tankas if we see study it and I understand also like Lamtse Ramche was just handing out I think like a mandala I didn't even look at it but anyways to uh, to really uh, to get accustomed to, to the Edam deities the peaceful and wrathful deities and to see them as our refuge as our friends and if we recognize that, then in the bar there will be without fear, without apprehension. And to, uh, to recognize it as self-appearance. Also in the bar the turtle is described in detail for people who are familiar with it. Uh, but most importantly is to, to be without fear and to recognize it as uh, self-arising uh, or self-appearance. And ideally we would liberate ourselves in this state just like a child who is jumping in the lap of its mother. Rapid <laughs> Hallelujah. I shall recognize whatever arises as the natural manifestation of my own awareness. So that's for an individual with the highest capacity. Whatever arises in the bardo, generally, but here, particularly in this fifth bardo, the bardo of Damata, when his peaceful and ruffled deities arise, to recognize it as the rangnang means one's own appearance. It's not something which arises somewhere else or outside of me. <laughs> so to recognize whatever arises as self-appearance, it's nothing else than the appearance of, of the essence of bodhicitta, in fact. And then, uh, that's for the individual with the highest capacity, but for a middling individual, at least to recognize, oh, now I'm in this bardo. And here it says, realizing that this is the way that the bardo appears. So for that's for the middle, uh, with the medium capacity, they recognize, well, that's the peace and ruffle did disappear now. That's the way this bardo of dharmata manifests. Uh, a vital moment will come when cessation is possible. Do not fear the throng of peaceful and wrathful deities, your own manifestation. So this moment will come here in the bardo of the Dharmata, where there will be very clear light, very strong light actually, actually two different lights of the deity. Uh, one is, actually only one of the deity, one is a very strong light, which is a natural light of the innate deities of primordial wisdom 
This is a very strong light. Uh, it connects to the wisdom light of the deities, and then there's a weak light also. <coughs> Five different colors of weak lights, and they connect to rebirths of the, of the six realms in samsara. So therefore, this very strong, overpowering light, which is bright, luster, uh, don't be afraid of it. Recognize it as your own appearance, appearing as this form of the peaceful, wrathful deities. Uh, yeah, recognizing a self-manifestation. Uh, uh, pray to it, take refuge in it, and without fear, so that we can uh, liberate ourselves in that moment. The so then we go to the sixth part of the bardo of uh, becoming it's called sipa bardo in tibetan where it says uh, <clears throat> ah now that the part of becoming is arising for me, uh, holding in mind my one-pointed longing, I shall try hard to prolong my good karma, it will be explained. Uh, stopping up the entrance to the womb, I shall remember to turn away from it. Now is the time I must have courage and pure perception. Uh, abandoning jealousy, I will meditate on the teacher and his consort in union. So at this time, uh, it's the bardo of, of becoming, and uh, it's important here to be also one-pointed in one's mind and to carry on with uh, trusting a faith in the Lama as the essence of the three jewels, and to, uh, to still propel in one's mind stream wholesome uh, thoughts of love, loving kindness and compassion, and to uh, take refuge in the Lama at this moment. And then to... Uh, Ideally, to, to block uh, stopping the entrance into a normal womb, uh, which means in an unwholesome birth, actually, uh, I shall remember to turn away from that. And uh, what we are asked to do, if we do have to uh, take a leap of faith uh, and to see at least uh, the Lama as uh, the Yidam, uh, the Lama as a Yidam uh, Yabyum, and uh, with trust and faith uh, direct our consciousness towards the Lama Yabyum and uh, take a rebirth there. Uh, so the consciousness would be directed towards that. Uh, there is lots to say about this, Ramji has said. Uh, it would suggest there would be many uh, words we could share for this in this context, but unfortunately we don't have time to go into detail right now. <laughs> So, Dabbasaggi, <laughs> 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 <
Then go out from Tom or Rotom or so then not thinking death will come uh, but I will live long having accomplished only the pointless activities of this life I would be uh, truly stupid to return now empty handed recognize that what is needed is the holy dharma so why don't I practice the dharma at this very moment so at this moment actually that's what's happening to most beings here in the Sipa Bardo that they are not able to, to maintain their practice or to maintain a wholesome thought of uh, love and loving kindness and uh, without any will, without any control, they just take rebirth um, mm -hmm. somewhere in the six realms. And they will continue there, have a, a life there, and continue again and again. And it might be very difficult to, for uh, hundreds and thousands of rebirth to find again this precious human uh, rebirth, to find this precious opportunity again. So uh, henceforth, even here, it's uh, stressed how important it is, this... Uh, the practice of, uh, of love, loving kindness, compassion, or the essence, which is described in the 37 practices of the Bodhisattva, which is uh, Bodhicitta, together with an understanding of law of cause and effect, so that we are not helplessly uh, propelled in one of the six realms. And what is really of true help at this moment is the, the precious Dharma. <laughs> <coughs> so henceforth it says recognize that what is needed is the precious or the holy dharma. So here the in this term it says rhetorically, so why don't I practice the Dharma at this very moment? As the great Siddhas have said. If we do not keep the Lama's instruction in our mind, we are betraying ourselves, aren't we? So that's exactly, uh, at this moment, it's, it's most vital that we can maintain uh, the instruction which we were given by the Lama, uh, which all summarize, if we quintessentialize them, they all summarize into a bodhicitta, enlightened mind. Practice of love and loving kindness with an understanding of cause and effect. Uh, we were given this, so keep them in, in your mind. So he says, otherwise we are betraying ourselves in this moment. So if this uh, will continue, and we'll make an hour break now. Uh, I mean, not continue, we'll conclude and make an hour break now, and then we'll continue with the next. Oh, my, oh, my.